So good evening, good evening from a very wet and windy Scotland in the middle of winter. Happy New Year to all of you. And I'm really happy to host this first webinar of the year. For those who haven't tuned in before, um, I'm Ian Craig, the founder of CISN. And basically, it's kind of my life's mission, if you like, to take the teachings of functional and integrative medicine and nutritional therapy into the sports and exercise space because athletes and sporting individuals, they're not immune to health challenge. So we, we actually, in my mind, actually need to support athletes more than the lay person. And detoxification is a very good example of that. If you look into any sports nutrition, like textbook or literature, you're, you're really hard pushed to find anything about detoxification. But that's going to change. I mean, five years ago, it was pretty much the same with uh, digestion in sport. But with the human microbiome research, over the past five years, we've started to see that word come into the sports literature. So we're in a really interesting and I think exciting time where we're starting to embrace health concepts in a sporting realm. Um, you'd think that the two were the same, but health and exercise or health and fitness are definitely not the same. That would be another good webinar discussion. Okay, so I would like you to get your fingers warmed up. And Brian, thanks for uh, kicking us off. Um, these are the two, three things I'd like you to put in the chat box just to introduce yourself. Where are you in the world? I like to see a big variety of people from different places. What do you do? And lastly, what would you like to learn this evening? What intrigued you to come onto a detox webinar in a sports context? I've got a little prize for you because um, I like interactive webinars. I don't like people just sitting back off camera and listening and I talk to myself, I like to get a little bit of interaction. So I'm going to give a prize to the person who interacts most on the chat box. And later on, if, um, if the numbers uh, are okay, you know, small enough, we can get you unmuted as well to ask questions and discussions. I, I enjoy that as well. So the prize to the most interactive person is a free place on our short course. So our short course starts next Thursday, and it's basically four weeks of once a week um, webinar style kind of tutorial and a few videos and readings and so on. So it's a nice short immersion into integrative sports nutrition. Okay, so fingers at the ready, get going guys. I see some of you have started already. So let's get into detox. And the first thing I want to do is basically talk about justification for detox support. And I remember way back in the early 2000s, I was, um, I was, I'd been an exercise professional for many years. I started studying nutritional therapy. Um, and I met this lady who told me, hmm, you need extra detox support because you're an athlete. And it didn't really quite make sense at that time because this is what we tend to think of exercise. Well, exercise creates a sweating response. We know sweat is really good for uh, detox, for getting stuff out, better out than in. Um, we know that exercise can bolster antioxidant enzyme activity like superoxide dismutase, glutathione catalase, up to a point, and there's a debate around antioxidants that I'll just touch on a bit later. We know exercise is excellent for circulation. It's excellent for lymphatic flow. It's excellent for fat mobilization. And all of these things can be really contributory to detoxification. So I absolutely wholeheartedly uh, acknowledge all these points about exercise. 
But there's a difference between, let's say, going on a yoga retreat and doing some uh, gentle exercise every day in the sun with some nice uh, sweating, some yoga, some Tai Chi, and pursuing a hard training protocol. And that's kind of where I'm going tonight. So I'm looking at serious athletes, but I'm also looking at serious recreational people who might call themselves athletes. So they're not elite, not anywhere near elite, but they take life seriously. And, and that's kind of been my bread and butter client, not the top podium people, but the ones who work, have a family, and they're training for something meaningful in their life. Okay, so I've got a few quizzes for you this evening, only three, so I won't challenge you too hard. The first one is this. All of his experience detox pressures, especially in this era, in this time more than ever. But can you name at least two extra detox challenges that are faced specifically by athletes? So I'm, I'm going to um, so continue on for a few slides and I'd like to see if some of you have a few thoughts on that. And then in two or three slides, I'll get to my thoughts on that, okay? All right, so firstly, what is a toxin? And, you know, there's lots of different definitions out there, but I like this array that was actually from an Ayurvedic website, an Ayurvedic blog site that I pulled up. So firstly, reactive undigested food residues. Ayurvedic practitioners are very into their digestibility. It goes more than just is it gluten or non-gluten or dairy or non-dairy like we tend to do in the West. It's about, well, how well do we prepare the food and how well do, how strong is our digestion to take care of that? So a heavy diet, inappropriate foods at the wrong time or a weak digestion can cause toxicity issues. The second section is kind of what we would tend to think of as toxins, and that's all the chemicals. That's all the artificial stuff that's come into existence over the last decades, 100 years, you know, not that long in civilization. We have basically been uh, in one big experiment for the last number of decades. I have to remind you that prior to modern environmental challenges, we still had a liver and kidneys and all the detoxification systems. So there are other things than just chemical aspects. And I tend to think, you know, you might talk to an athlete about, ex, um, about detox and they might say, well, I don't smoke and I hardly ever drink. So yeah, it's not a big deal. There are only a couple of things that could contribute. The last one is, is very much a 21st century one. And I'm going to come back to that later. It's the one we don't see. And that's actually one of the ones I'm most concerned about. Okay, so we're getting some really nice responses here. So thank you. I'm just going to keep going forward. I love this quote. In a colossal toxicological experiment carried out over the last, uh, I can't see all the words, the last few decades, there has been the unprecedented production and release of tens of thousands of chemical agents into the environment without sufficient consideration for human safety. Yeah, I mean, absolutely, it kind of says all. And athletes are humans in this environment, so they also have to deal with that too. All right, so in a sporting context now, what do we need to consider? But in detoxification and athletes, this is quite a powerful quote. Detoxification processes require a greater supply of ATP, the chemical form of energy, than any other biochemical process in the body. Now, this is a, a book that I really enjoy called The Biochemical Imbalances of Disease from a couple of ladies I used to work with in nutritional therapy. And 
I've tried to chase this up and all I found was cow data on energetic requirements of detoxification. I'm sure there's some human data out there somewhere. So if anyone finds some, please pass it on. But I believe this detoxification is a really important um, and energetic, costly process that we need to do. So why then would an athlete who needs that ATP to propel themselves around a track or up and down a court or through the water, spend some of that ATP, which is a finite supply, on just processing junk? All right, so just a question for you. All right, so detox pressures of athletes. Let, let me see what you've got. Um, okay, so we've got... Um, so Duncan, detox of raised metabolic byproducts. Excellent. Stress-related toxins. You've got two of mine. Well done. Uh, Rania, Rania. Uh, lactate environment stress, great. You've got another another one. Um, okay, stress environment, skin diet choices. That's general, uh, Janet. Um, but yeah, absolutely for the uh, athlete as well. Lack of food, soil quality in the present day from Paul. Yes, absolutely. Uh, high intensity exercises can overwhelm the body physically and emotionally. Detox requires a high amount of right. So cool. Uh, we've got some good backup there. All right, so what did I come up with? An athlete's body needs to process everything a regular person needs to clear, plus free radicals from hard training, especially if the training happens close to sources of pollution. Like I used to live in London, and let's say somebody runs to work or cycles on the perimeter of Regent Park um, or King's... Um, Richmond Park, these are good cycling uh, places. There's a lot of pollution around the city. Metabolites from cellular respiration during exercise. So um, lactate would come to mind there. The lactate needs to be recycled to glucose through what's called the Cori cycle, and that happens in the liver. So the liver is called into action here. Then we get stress hormones. Let's take cortisol. Cortisol needs to be cleared once it's produced by glucuronidation, which is a phase two detoxification. Then we've got endo and exotoxins from gut flora. So that, that's not unique to athletes, but as we've seen with the newer research in athletes' digestive health, a lot of imbalance can, uh, can occur in athletes specifically, especially endurance athletes, and especially runners who are bouncing up and down and shuggling their, sorry, that's a Scottish term, shuggling their gut all around as they're, as they're moving. And then food additives from standard sports products. Now you do get the lay person having Lucozade Sport or Energade or, you know, all sorts of different things, but sports people potentially would have more than the, the average person. Okay, so my extra pressures that we need to be aware of, of athletes. Right, and this is just a, a little further justification that we need to be aware of detox uh, in a sporting setting. So this is a, a football specific scenario. It's in Brazilian first division teams. So these are good football players, right? So, quote, a reduction in urea creatine ratio and an estimated glomerular, I never can say that properly, filtration rate, i.e. kidney process, was observed post-match, suggesting a decrease of renal function. So, yes, exercise can demand so much of the system that more effort from the body is put into, you know, the exercise itself, the skeletal muscles, um, that our detoxification may decrease at a time when we need actually more of it. So that recovery process we're then going into is really crucial. If we then follow up post-match with lots of colorful drinks, it could be a problem. Uh, well, it could certainly decrease the, the rate of recovery. Right, and then just an added one here. Um, we tend to think of athletes as a healthy bunch, but 
actually the modern day athlete, a lot of them take medications for various things. Okay. And this guy, Mike Wakeman, he's written a lot for me over the years uh, when I edited FSN magazine. And basically he's a pharmacologist who studied more into medication effects. Right. So here's a few things uh, that he shares in this paper. So your non-steroidals are probably the most common thing used by athletes to impede inflammation post heavy exercise. Neg negatively impacts folate, B6, C, as well as iron and the microbiota. That's quite a lot. Beta-2 agonists, a lot of athletes have exercise-induced uh, asthma. Even high-profile athletes, I remember Paula Radcliffe, for example, um, in, impact negatively on magnesium and potassium stadium, uh, sta status. Contraceptive pill, a lot of female athletes will actually use it to try and level out the hormonal fl flux so they're not caught in a competition mid, you know, when the period comes along. Antibiotics, these are just a few things I've shared from him. And then the last thing I want to add here from a different source, genetic factors can account for 20 to 95% patient variability in drug responses. And this is a fairly new area of uh, genomic research called pharmacogenomics. So you can actually, uh, I worked with a group in Johannesburg that um, brought that out to, uh, you know, to doctors in the country. That's a big range. So it's not just the, the fact they're taking the medication that some of them won't process it very well and then it will have a big effect on their body. All right. On the right hand side there, you'll see Mike's book, which I've got a copy of. Um, it's a really good resource if you're working in this area with serious athletes that might be medicating. All right. One final justification before I move on to the next section. The accelerated metabolic demands of the working muscle cannot be met without a robust response from the liver. If not for the metabolic, sorry, hepatic response, sustained exercise would be impossible. The names down be below there, especially Wasserman, are heavyweights in the exercise physiology uh, literature. So that's not in the functional medicine area. This is in standard, you know, physiology. So it's important. The liver is a key, key area. If we bog it down with too much gunk, then we slow ourselves down at the same time. Um, okay. Any... Um, Paul, Paul's just put in the chat box, COVID vaccines in my personal story. Um, yeah, Paul, um, after the, I think it was the second one, he got um, shingles bout, and shingles is obviously a, you know, it can result from a depletion of nutrient status. So uh, if we have time later, we can bring Paul on to discuss that. But it's a, it's a weighting of any kind of medications. All right, so what is clean sport? Your next quiz, which there aren't any wrong answers for, please share your perception of what is meant by the word clean within the context of nutrition or sports nutrition. So when we think clean sport now, we, we rightly might think of this company, Inform Sport, who I've interacted with a lot over the years. They used to write some really nice articles for FSN magazine. And They've done an amazing job going from a, an era pre-2010 where all the major kind of um, organizations and sports told athletes just not to take supplements. Um, but athletes were taking supplements kind of, uh, you know, on the sly. And some of them were taking stuff that just wasn't good quality and it might have led to drug positive drug tests. So these guys batch test supplements for safety in terms of non-contamination. So that's generally what's uh, meant by clean sport. 
You've also got ESNA, so the European Specialist Sports Nutrition Alliance, which is basically getting behind or, or building relationships with ethical nutrition supplement companies. And they're also doing an amazing job. And I'm just going to go on to an example. So I'm not naming names. I'll off camera or later in the q and I'll talk brands if you want me to. But for now, I'm just sharing examples. This is a top UK muscle brand. And they, they talk about clean ingredients now. And if we just blow up one of these, the strawberry, the only real thing that I don't like in there is the sucralose. The rest you can, it's all the laboratory produced stuff. That's the only downside, but they, they've got rid of most of the gunk. Um, just as an aside, I mean, sucralose has various problems. If I have one scoop of a protein powder with sucralose, it, it irritates my gut. Yeah, I, I just can't do it. I can't be the only athlete with a sensitive gut. Um, I prefer to source a plain protein powder, which could be any variety depending on your individual tolerance and enjoyment of it and then build it up into a nice smoothie. You've got lots of nice natural ingredients there. So that's that's my way, that's my interpretation of clean sport. And then what about gels? So this is an example from another um, big company in the UK that has focused on sport and it's a caffeine or a coffee gel and again, I mean, they're a lot better than five or 10 years ago. You used to have a look at these brands and they'd be filled with chemical this, chemical that. It's got a lot better. But again, it's all factory produced stuff. What about this? This is, uh, this is I can't call it my gel, but it's just something I pulled off a blog site once and it works really well. I did a long trail run using this gel and a few different things a couple of years ago and it tastes really nice. The chia seeds, the molasses, the honey, bit of salt, it really works nicely. And of course the coffee taste I quite enjoyed. So let's see what you guys come up with. All right, so minimally processed. Um, Brian, with healthy diet or supplements necessary? I'm gonna answer that a wee bit later. Uh, please remind me if I don't. Uh, Duncan clean spore eliminating substances. Okay, so getting rid of toxicity. Um, okay, <laughs> Rachel's food course. Yes, absolutely. Um, that is very clean and but beyond clean, it, it's actually up kind of almost up regulating your nutritional densities and varieties. Um, Nicola says clean diet, no processed foods organically plant-based right you can come <laughs> you can join my crew nicola that's a good answer high quality ingredient supplementation sports specific electrolytes and source protein powders okay so some really nice answers there guys so well done it's basically let's take the detail that sports nutrition gives us because there's a lot of good stuff there but if we can get it whole food as possible, that, that's a bonus to me, if you if you like. And there's sport context where you just can't. Like if you're doing a cycling race in the heat, you can't really do your DIY sports drink. And then you got a fruit juice sitting in the heat. But what I did, I remember I did a 100 kilometer cycle race two, three years back. For the half, I had two bottles, two 750 ml bottles with DIY sports drink with my favorite favorite ingredient, which I'll share later. Halfway along, I had a good quality organic powdered product um, that then I mixed with water. So I ended up with four bottles uh, over the ride. Um, the second half wasn't as nice tasting though. Okay, so quiz number three. Which groups of nutrients are needed by our detox processes and certain biochemical pathways that are un, uh, unregulated during exercise? Unregulated is the wrong word there. Um, like, what have I written there? 
upregulated should be the right word. Okay, so which biochemical processes are upregulated when we exercise and what nutrients do they need that might compete with the detox processes? That's my question, or vice versa. Okay, so if you're a nutritional therapist, uh, you can go to sleep now because you've probably had this drilled into you. It's the liver diagram. So we got basically fat soluble toxins going through phase one into intermediate metabolites, pushing through to phase two to become water soluble and then easy to excrete through, uh, through the bile and feces, through the urine, through the sweat, through the lungs. These are the reactions, or at least the well-studied reactions in these processes. But what I'm interested in here is what do we need to propel these processes? So phase one, what have we got? We got vitamin A, vitamin B3, B6, folate, B12, we get glutathione, branched chain amino acids. We've got some flavonoids, we got some phospholipids. So there's a nice mix there of vitamins, especially B vitamins. Uh, there's some amino acids, there's some anti, uh, antioxidants as well. Then we've got intermediate reactive oxygen species can happen really strongly here if phase one and phase two aren't well balanced. So the nutrients in the middle are really important. And just as a sort of overall, there's a lot of antioxidant support at this level. And then for the phase two, it's mostly about amino acids, a big, big time uh, support from amino acids at this level, okay? So that is a little one screen um, kind of representation of what an athlete needs to propel their detox processes to get that gunk out of their system after they've had that brightly colored uh, sports drink. So just talking about um, nutritional therapists having to learn that liver diagram. If you're a sports practitioner, you'll know this one inside out, the Krebs cycle. This is from the Cardo Catch and Catch. This is a um, basically a, a scan of, of their diagram but it misses some very vital detail and that's the cofactors. So tapping into Braley and Lord who write in functional medicine arenas, these are all the cofactors required for the Krebs cycle to go around. Can you start to see some crossover there? A lot of B vitamins, lipoic acid or lipoic is antioxidant supporting um, we've got magnesium, manganese, there's crossover, right? So if you're using your B vitamins heavily for your detox, hmm, there might not be as much to produce ATP through the Krebs cycle, but yet the detox processes need a lot of ATP. So there's some competition going on there. And then antioxidants, we saw in the liver diagram, we need a lot of antioxidants just for detoxification. Now, this is a sort of a, this is a textbook called Antioxidants in Sports Nutrition. It's, it's kind of the conventional view. And I'm going to come back to Brian's question here um, about do we need supplementation? So according to these guys in this particular chapter of this book, Antioxidant intake during exercise training to maintain an appropriate physiological antioxidant status in reference to current uh, recommendations can be achieved by consumption of a well-balanced and of a balanced and well-diversified diet. Now that's almost become a mantra in sports nutrition now. Um, I'd say yes, but in theory, yes, but how hard are we training? How much support do we really need? What is that balanced and well-diversified diet? Is it just a diet free of chemical stuff? Or is it a really ramped up Rachel type diet? Rachel, if you don't know, is my wife, who's a plant-based uh, natural chef. She does amazing things with food in terms of amping the, the nutrient di diversity and density of the, of the food. 
So there's a lot of questions that come in here. And then I've got a slide coming up about genetics. So there's a big question mark. Also, there's an antioxidant debate. And that's basically, it's been well studied now that if you supplement too high a dose of antioxidant, it can impede recovery processes or adaptation processes. Um, so it's beyond the scope of tonight. It could be a whole webinar on its own. But if you want to read about that, I've, I've written, um, I wrote an article last year. So here's a link to it on the BANT website. Okay, so here's the one that I was talking about. This is Russian and Polish high-level athletes and looking at GSTP1. Okay, so glutathione S-transferase, which is a very key antioxidant enzyme system involved in overall antioxidant support of the body, therefore under training circumstances, but heavily used for detoxification devices as well. So basically, our findings emphasize that the G allele of this gene is associated with improved endurance performance. Now, when I read that, I was like, oh, that's interesting. I didn't expect that. I expected better detox, but not improved endurance. And then they go on to maybe suggest that it could potentially be because a better clearance of exercise-induced ROS or reactive oxygen species. So that was really, really interesting. Again, a small bit of research in the big world of sports and nutrition. We need more of this. We need more discussion around it. All right, back to a simpler diagram. We're still on what do we need? What nutrients do we need in a sporting context? Um, this is the diagram you just saw, just, you know, tune down. This is my client diagram. And when I present to practitioners, I will sometimes deliberately share client-centered stuff because it's an important skill to be able to uh, convey complex stuff to our clients. So this is a little sketch I kind of put together. What do we need for our liver detox? Well, we tend to think of broccoli. So the whole cruciferous family is really, really supportive. So to the allium family, the sulfurous family, limonene is on citrus peel. Protein, that represents the raw variety. This is the vegetarian variety of protein. Carotenoids, I more antioxidants, what I call green shit which will support the liver and ultimately help the athlete to love their liver. Uh, the green shit, by the way, sorry, just kind of what I talked to my clients about, the ones I know well, um, it's just things like chlorella, spirulina, barley grass, the kind of stuff you'd get in a green formulation. And it can make a difference to detoxification, especially people with these GST genes tuned down. Okay, they need more, all the help that they can get. If somebody has glutathione S transfers on a uh, nutrigenomic test, null, you actually need to feed them more cruciferous vegetables as a kind of min minimum, and maybe supplement them as well. This is a little resource for you to take. I'm not, I'm not going to go through it in detail. <clears throat> It's split up into phase two and intermediate metabolites. Uh, sorry, phase one. And then, sorry, this should be phase two. Uh, I didn't notice that earlier. So the different processes, what nutrients are required for the phase and how we might support that with foods, food and supplements. This section's kind of geared more around supplements, but you could quite easily talk to Dr. Google and type in some of these nutrients and just say foods rich in flavonoids, foods rich in N-acetylcysteine. <clears throat> and you start actually getting a really good profile of which foods are really good. So it comes to my favorite detox supporting foods. In a nutshell, Foods that are detox supporting are 
nature made, or if you're religious, God made food and not man-made food. All right, so what we have done to the food chain over the last century is horrendous. And there's polar opposite effects on the body between very chemicalized, highly processed food and stuff you get out of the ground off trees, out of bushes, and, and obviously animal, well-sourced animal protein. But we're starting to come around within farming knowledge. Um, it's just not a common thing yet, and especially with our athletes. And depending on who you work with, I think of my colleague, uh, Adam Lloyd, who works with young footballers, they're not interested in, you know, nature made food, they're, you know, it's just a challenge getting enough carbohydrates into them for their food. So you, you take people where they are and just see what improvement you can make. Right, champion detoxers. Glucosinolates. So sugar based molecules that predominantly come from the cruciferous family, and they can form isothiocyanates. So think sulfurous, um, broccoli, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts, cabbage, etc. Sauerkraut, homemade sauerkraut, I love because you're bringing this group in and you're bringing a fermentation and effect on gut health. And gut health and detox are bosom buddies. If you burden the, uh, the gut, you're also burning the liver. There's no two ways about that. Flavonoids, so these are basic the stuff in plants with polyphenol chemical structure. They're very powerful antioxidants and they're generally in nature a defense mechanism against bugs and you know predators that could eat them. Allicin, so you saw the allium family, so onions, garlic, leeks, chives, etc., which can increase the glutathione activity. And curcumin. Curcumin has become very well studied. It used to just be the domain of uh, India and, you know, why are Indian people so healthy? Well, that's kind of changed as the Indian populations bring in our, in our Western ideologies. But meantime, we're trying to learn from their Eastern ideologies, which is really good. Here's a broccoli um, little subject, which is nice. It's in rats. We need a lot more stuff in human subjects. But when I first went down researching the detox topic, I do a big lecture on detox in our certificate course. I thought I'd find nothing. I thought I'd have to do lots of cross correlations, but actually I found a few things. Enough. Enough to justify it. So, Exhaustive exercise was clearly responsible for tissue damage, evidenced by the increase of lactate dehydrogenase plasma, can't read that, activity. Moreover, the exercise protocol reduced catalase activity. So catalase is one of the enzyme antioxidant systems. That's quite important. A broccoli-enhanced diet led to reduce cholesterol oxidation following exhaustive exercise. So if you're aware in the kind of um, cardiovascular health arena, it's not just cholesterol that's the problem. It's when we oxidize cholesterol and make it get sticky, and then there's a lot of oxidative stress going around that it becomes a problem. So just by eating broccoli, we can reduce this. And it's in an exercise context. Here's plant polyphenols, which I really, really like this area. So what did they find? Polyphenols modulate the expression of cytochrome P450 enzymes, which is phase one detox, and may increase the expression of phase two conjugation, including glutathione conjugation and glucuronidation. If you remember, Cortisol is cleared through uh, glucuronidation. Glutathione pretty much does everything. Uh, you know, it's a major, major contributor to detoxification. So this is amazing. Polyphenols, nature, 
you know. So every year we go and scavenge brambles. In England, you call them um, blackberries. And yeah, it's great. These guys have had to survive in the wild. Nobody's pruning the bushes. They're having to survive and look after themselves. So they're packed full of these polyphenol defense mechanisms. I remember the, the research about salvestrol coming out a number of years ago, and these kind of like wild berries can modulate against cancer uh, potentials. You know, it's, it's not quite that simple, but, you know, there's a contributing factor there. Right, and then to my favorite DIY sports drink, this is what I drank the first half of that 100K bike ride. One of my students, Thomas, he's a GP in um, Austria. He wrote this for the FSN magazine last year and really gave a nice big justification to pomegranate in sport. Now, it's rather expensive. They don't grow too many of them in the UK, especially up here in Scotland. I once drank a whole pint in Jerusalem and it was delicious and it gave me an idea. This must be high in antioxidants, but it's not supplementing the, uh, the big doses of vitamin C and vitamin E, which has been researched. It's, it's more plant-based, it's, it's an extract. So can we use this in sport? And I think we can. So just a couple of further considerations and then I'm done. Roots of toxin removal, what else can we do? So if we look at how we remove stuff from the body, we get stuff out from the bile. So does our liver produce bile well? Is the gallbladder working? Is the gut clearing? If we're constipated, doesn't matter how much bile we're producing, we're going to get some recirculation. Kidneys, how well are the waterworks working? Are we getting enough water? How's the uh, electrolyte balance? Really important in detox. Skin, here comes exercise. Can we eliminate some sweat through the skin? Or let's take do some saunas, far infrared saunas. There's various protocols. I've only scratched the surface tonight, more kind of justifying the importance of this area for athletes. But when you jump into functional medicine, you, you get a whole load of uh, you know, protocols that go much deeper, if required. Lungs, we're breathing out uh, particles through the lungs. So again, exercise is really key. And then lymphatics, again, exercise. So. When we detoxify, exercise is a really crucial thing, but we shouldn't be going and doing crazy programs during, you know, if we're actually actively doing a, um, uh, a sort of detox clear out. All right, and then the last thing, EMFs. The re results of the recent studies not only demonstrate that EMF exposure triggers oxidative stress in various tissues, but also that it causes significant changes in levels of blood antioxidant markers. Right, this to me is 21st century smoking, but much worse because we can't see it and everyone seems oblivious to it. In an exercise sense, especially when we're also in, the, in an era of push it harder, let's just push through, we're in a hit era, the CrossFit era, the triathlon era, the go longer era. This pushes the system even further because of all the constant exposure we have. So I, for one, have wired our house completely with ethernet cables, completely off Wi-Fi. But I did a little experiment this morning. I switched on my Wi-Fi and my computer. We're in a suburban area with houses well spaced, I could pick up 18 <laughs> Wi-Fi's uh, if I had the passwords for other people's. So yeah, th this is an issue. Paul, who's online, talks about marginal, marginal gains. Um, marginal gains tend to be thought in different ways, but Stuff like this is more than marginal gains. We can make a big difference to our health, which can have a big play on our performance. 
And here's a here's a book that I can re recommend if I've just stimulated a thought for you. Uh, this is an easy access, 15 quid off Amazon type book that you can uh, have a wee look at. All right. So I've got references. Everything is referenced from what was on those slides. Because this is a free webinar, we have a little commercial break. So I'm just gonna have a minute or two to tell you about what's coming up. We, we started a short course in September, which went really well. So we're, we're gonna run that again next week. We've also taken the certificate course, which was three modules and broken it up into standalone things, standalone units. So you can come in and take one of our units at a time. And if you wanna do the certificate, you can add them up. You can take it continually, or you can just you know cherry pick and add them up, or you can just do certain things by CPD. So a lot of these will be sort of uh, roll, rolled out later in the year, but we're starting with a short course next week. Um, so this is, there's the web link for it. Week one, we go into the kind of integrative and fun functional aspects brought into sport. Week two, we do performance nutrition, always applied, always with questions, always with kind of our way of thinking to just get you questioning stuff in sports nutrition. Week three, we look at a couple of specialty, specialist topics, including hypertrophy and um, overtraining. And then week four um, is a one-on-one -on -one 30 minutes with me just to talk about whatever you want to talk about. All right, so let's have some questions. I did say when I was, uh, you know, tweeting and stuff that I would share my detox program. So I've got some slides coming up so I can do that, but let's get into some questions first. So guys, you've been really interactive on, on the chat. So thanks very much. Um, okay, Jody, yes, my wife. Um, she is on, she's kind of on Facebook. Um, if you look at the nutritionalinstitute.com, you'll find her. That's our um, client website, the nutritionalinstitute.com. And then you can follow her from, from there. So she does a bit on Facebook and she's on Twitter as well. Her name's, I'll just type her in. Uh, Everyone. Yeah, okay. So she's on Twitter. Twitter, Facebook, hasn't gone to Instagram quite yet. Right. Brian, yes, there's some very good male cooks. Uh, okay. Lovely, okay. Right, any questions about detox? Any questions about what you have heard tonight? Paul, you got anything to add? Um, oh, Brian, I'll just answer your pomegranate compared to beetroot question. Um, they're different things. Beetroot's very high in nitrates, so it's been really studied for nitrates, which are vasodilatory, and therefore they've been studied in a ergogenic aid kind of context. So if we can dilate the blood vessels better or more, it can improve endurance performance. This context I'm bringing um, pomegranate in is more the antioxidants, so similar to cherries, Cherries were well studied around 2010 as well when beetroot was getting popular. Um, so different context, but of course beetroot has lots of color. So it's it's got antioxidant support as well. I'm not sure how many nitrates pomegranate has, maybe not so much. Um, it's more the leafy greens and stuff that, that tend to be high in nitrates. That type of research, has started with specific things like beetroot and it, it's just slowly going out. And I think over the next decade, let's say 2010 to 2020, we had a lot of consolidation of plant-based research. 
I think now we're going to see a, a proliferation. So I'll be really excited. Uh, doo -doo -doo -doo. Right, anything else? Uh, Paul, do you want to share anything? Do you want to share your story about the... Yeah, your... I, can certainly, I can certainly come in there. In, as, uh, in general terms, I've found that, particularly with athletes, um, it, it tends to be a sort of drip, drip, drip process, actually, with them. And it's a, this trade-off between health and performance that we've spoken about sort of so much in the past. And athletes, particularly elite athletes, are so focused in on the performance side of things that health will very much sort of come secondary. And it's, it's a big learning process that you've got to go through with the guys to actually get them thinking more. Now, we've discussed a lot in the past that health is the best um, ergogenic aid that you're ever going to get. But getting that across, actually, to the athletes can be difficult. And certain athletes, uh, my own branch of sport, uh, bodybuilding, strength athletes, are probably some of the worst in the world um, for these sorts of things. Obviously, they've got a horrible reputation for drug use. But even leading that aside, getting them to think of anything over and above 19-inch arms or being able to squat 600 pounds um, becomes difficult. It's, as I say, it's very much a, it's a learning process with people. And I find that you've got to take them slowly, slowly through rather than trying to rush a lot of this. Otherwise, you simply get into an overwhelm um, situation. On the if I if I can push on with the COVID, um, I'm a bit hesitant to talk about it because I don't want to get into a big COVID conspiracy theory type discussion. But I'll just share my own situation, and it's been nowhere near as bad as some. But I was double jabbed and boosted when everything first came around, and for my 30 years experience down at the gym where I train and work. I've never seen a case of shingles in 30 years. I mean, in the space of six months of actually having um, the jabs, four of us, about my sort of age, 50 and above, come down with shingles. Now, it may well have been a complete coincidence, but as you know, shingles is the reactivation of the old um, chickenpox virus. Um, so we got over that. And then a little while ago, I had another skin complaint came up, which the doctor spoke about again as the reactivation of a virus. Now, I'm just getting more and more suspicious about the indignities that my immune system have suffered and the genetic um, quirks that may well be going on within me. It's got a lot to do with the shingles and the other complaints that I've actually had. Got no proof. I've got nothing to actually back that up. But you know, just my own experience where I base so much of this stuff, I will use the science, as you know, Ian, but I will also put an awful lot of faith in personal experience on what me and my clients are actually finding in the real world. So just a few, just a few comments, Ian. Thanks, Paul. And I and I think. You know, we're as humans, we're generally quick to look at singular sources of things. But that can be a good example of some kind of medication that has burdened the system at some level, required an extra nutritional resource to try and balance. And then it, it leaves the immune system compromised or overwhelms the detoxification system. And then something else happens. So we're we're a finite body source. So we can't just keep throwing stuff at it. And athletes are a good example of that. Uh, we tend to think in a macro term. So like you said, performance oriented, Paul. So in nutrition, it's about the macros. You know, how many carbs, proteins, and fats do we need? And never mind how we get it in. And that was when I was an athlete as a runner 20 years ago. Yeah, 20 years ago. Um, 
that was my thinking as well. So I've done a race. Let's re refuel with uh, just whatever's in the service station on the way home. But this can have a massive implication to our recovery process. What happened? What would happen if you actually have some good food available after that race or competition to the recuperation process? There's a big question there. Right. Any do, 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 do. right? I had reactions to shingles. Um, okay, predispose. Yeah. Okay, so thank you. Um, right. So I'll I'll share my detox um process. And I put this over tonight, not in a deep dive. You know, the courses that I run are 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 all about getting the detail. The webinars I run are to try and stimulate thought. So hopefully I've done that okay. So therefore I'm gonna share some client kind of resources and including what I hand out to my clients. So this is my analogy that I talk to my clients about. <clears throat> so say between our environmental exposure our gut that might not be well balanced, our food, our drink, et cetera, et cetera. We, we, we're trying to push 100 units through a factory and the liver's the factory. It's not that simple. <laughs> we don't detoxify all over our body, but in client language, it works quite well. But the factory can go only cope with 90 units per day, right? What's going to happen with the extra 20 units? It's going to go into the storage shed. Where is the storage shed? Well, mostly adipose tissue. We hope it's the adipose tissue, but if we do too much of that, we end up having toxicity stored in brain tissue and cardiovascular tissue and liver um, places we don't want it. So let's change this around a little bit. Let's try and improve our factory. So we're supporting the liver a bit now so it can process 110 units per day. And at the same time, we're gonna, um, or that, that evens things out, so we're no longer storing. And then let's reduce the toxicity. Let's become more environmentally and food aware to reduce the toxic load. Ah, we're now in better balance. And we can start actually taking toxicity out of the storage shed. So that's a very simple analogy I use with my clients. So this is the kind of information that I'll share with my clients. Again, I'm not going to read through all of it. I'll just share a few things. But it should just get them on a process if you've done a good job. So buy organic when you can or start learning about that process. Be mindful of obviously things like alcohol and caffeine, which directly challenge the liver. Some foods will be cause sensitivity responses in one person and not another. So if you can understand personal situations, avoid plastic as much as possible. That's another 21st century, well, 20th and 21st century, it's a real big toxic load. Filter our water. Our water is generally full of xenoestrogens. Oh, I learned from a client last week. I brought up the Wi Fi and EMF kind of story that Wi Fi frequencies can have xenoestrogen effects on our body. Now, isn't that a bit scary? And they can reactivate retroviruses, which then start reactivating other viruses like herpes. Um, so the shingles story, like Epstein-Barr, which I experienced when I had COVID last year, it wasn't the COVID I felt I had. I had a three-week kind of lagging effect of Epstein-Barr. I, I could feel that. Um, change toiletries, eco-friendly stuff, household cleaning products. Uh, where are you exercising? Uh, try and reduce the EMFs and stress management. So this is a kind of basic overall detox approach. This is uh, my handout, the page one part of it. So 
I do feeds to, food to eat, food, uh, foods to avoid. And I've got three categories, stuff to push up, namely vegetables, especially certain kinds of veg, things to moderate, and then things to avoid. And in the avoid, we think of detox as a void, but I always start with, well, what are we going to add in first? That's more important. Things to avoid, gluten, dairy, sugar, refined oils, food, basically chemicals, alcohol, caffeine, fizzy drinks. Now, if somebody is on eight cups of coffee a day, don't suddenly take them to zero. You might take the three weeks to wean them down to two. Or if they're on three, take three weeks to wean them off to zero. That sort of thing, because you, you get withdrawal headaches. I don't often work with alcoholics. So, you know, generally I can take somebody fully off alcohol pretty quickly. Sugar is a big one. The gluten one, as I said earlier, with the Ayurvedic kind of mention, I'm now firmly of the belief it's not about gluten or not gluten. There's a lot of research now with gluten and celiac and autoimmunity, for example. I'm of the belief it's more the modern grains that, yes, are higher in gluten, but they're also higher in certain other proteins that are hard to digest. If you actually start preparing stuff in a very digestible format, as they do stroke did in India and older cultures, our gut has an easier time. And I'll give you an example. Potatoes. Now, most of us think potatoes are okay, unless you're like, mm, they might spike your blood glucose, I need to avoid potatoes. Or you might think nightshade family and autoimmunity, so there's connections there, but I've never seen too much of a strong connection there. Potatoes, to me, are mostly a decent alternative to too much bread and gluten, grains, and so on. But Rachel joined a... Um, I joined a new forum last week. She came out with a bit of information that I'd never heard of, which was great because she always rubs her hands and said, yes, I've taught Ian something. That's great. Um, basically, potatoes, just like many other foods, contain some uh, elements that are hard to digest in their basic form. So this other teacher, what she actually does is put some in a crock pot, which is what you use to make sauerkraut, for two or three days, just in brine water, where the, the potato actually starts fermenting and fermentation actually breaks, starts breaking down hard to digest stuff. Bacteria love the stuff that our gut struggles to break down. And, and therefore she was starting to do like two to three day fermented potato pieces and then putting them in the oven and coming out with really healthy chips. That did taste good and, you know, were nice to digest. Same with dairy. What kind of milk is it? Where did it come from? Is it mass produced or is it the local dairy farm that does things organically and old fashioned? And secondly, is it fermented or not? And is it fermented properly? Is it a, um, something like Yeo Valley or ironically Rachel's Dairy who, who do good dairy products? Or is it a mass produced bases that pretend they're a yogurt, but they've fast-tracked the fermentation and then they pasteurize it after it's been fermented, which most kefir products actually are pasteurized. So be careful with that if you go to supermarkets. Same with sauerkraut. Most sauerkraut has been pasteurized. I mean, it's like, okay, well, it's not sauerkraut anymore if it's pasteurized. So we need better awareness of food. So just to kind of sum up this area, we've spent so much time and energy and scientific research to go more technical, more and more technical. But I'm finding solace now in my well-advanced career. I've been doing nutrition for 25 years now that I'm going more back to basics. I'm really enjoying reading about Ayurvedic or Chinese medicine or, you know, what did they used to do? What did they do before this commercialized era that we live in now? And can we replicate that? 
So I love learning from Rachel in terms of how she prepares food. And that comes straight in here. So it's not a black or white, avoid this and eat that. It's a, well, let's A, source as best as we can, and B, let's prepare as best we can, and let's bring in individual awareness. Um, I'll give you a little personal example here. My mom's been recently having some digestive issues, and I said, well, try one day. She always would have breakfast as soon as she wakes up. So I was listening to the Ayurvedic thing of, um, well, let the body wake up so that the digestion is awake before you give it something to digest. So <laughs> she got up and went for a walk, felt really lightheaded because she hadn't had her breakfast and uh, <laughs> it wasn't the right thing for her because her constitution is kind of like mine, very slim, high metabolism. She needed her breakfast and it totally threw her, her out of balance. Whereas with other clients, I can say, skip your breakfast to just get your digestion warmed up. Not every day, but occasionally just to get your body wanting food. But we're in the era of podcasting. We must do intermittent fasting or we must do keto or we must do this or that. It's about individuality and what works for you or your client. Um, and this is just a screenshot of a few kind of example meals and snacks that, uh, that I've put together for clients. Now, I'm very happy to share this with you guys, but I'd just like you to, to request that you email me and ask me for it. Um, so I'm not just you know sharing it to everyone that might just kind of go out because it, it is something I've put some effort in for my clients. And you can either use it as is with my brand on it, or you can use it to inspire your own detox program for your own clients. All right, so I'm gonna stop the share there and ask if there's any further questions before I finish up. Uh, okay. Okay, thank you guys. All right, so no more questions at the moment. Uh, can we have a future webinar on older 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 athlete, older adults? Yes, we can because the man who's already spoken, Paul Oren, we're in discussion of setting up a webinar later in the year of health span rather than lifespan. So that you've got to look forward to. Paul is really really passionate in that area. Okay, any last questions? Um, hands up, who's interested in the short course next week? Um, if you are, great, it'd be lovely to have you. It's only, the short course is only 249 pounds. So it's not a massive investment. We've tried to do it as a easy access. It's not a massive course. It's literally 90 minute tutorial per week a couple of 20 minute videos to watch and then a couple of bits of reading. So we've kind of trimmed it down to just give you a really nice taster. And then if you really like it, you can do the bigger course or cherry pick different uh, other ones. So yeah, just give me, give me a shout and we can get you going. And as I say, any requests for anything else you want to hear about. All right. Ian, just one very quick thing, if I can. Yeah, go for it. Um, one big problem with athletes um, and other people at the moment, of course, that we've got to be aware of, is the subject of cost. Um, you know, we're all living sort of like through this uh, various crisis at the moment. And I don't know about everyone else, but my weekly shopping bill is getting ridiculous at the moment. So we've got to be very mindful of what we actually recommend to our clients. And in some of these cases, the best one in the world, it's got to be a case of best efforts rather than just having to do this because we all know that organic, free range, grass fed, da, 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 is a lot more expensive and yet it's a lot better for you um, without a shadow of doubt. But we've also got to operate in the real world here and recognize that an awful lot of people are not going to be able to afford this or at least 
only afford part of it. Yeah, absolutely. Really, really good point. And some of us practitioners will work with wealthy folk who can just go and buy the best that they can find, but many, many who can't. Um, so I used to, as, as you know, work in South Africa. And unfortunately, it's still very race skewed in terms of uh, income. So if you worked with, um, I'm not sure what the, the right term is nowadays, I'll just say a black athlete, they generally didn't have the budget. But you would find they would be buying lots of processed foods. Instead, you could send them to the fruit and veg shop, of which there were many, which were cheaper than the supermarkets. And they can buy some pumpkin and butternut and a few fruits and vegetables. And it wasn't that expensive. You could fill a trolley with this stuff. In the UK, you don't get these lower cost fruit and veg places so readily. But an example, air where I live, you go to the supermarkets, but then every Saturday you get a couple of guys who have come straight from the wholesale market in Glasgow with fruit and veg. They're substantially cheaper than the supermarket. So to me, there's no excuse to go and buy processed products which have a brand price tag on them. Sometimes the packaging costs more to produce than what's inside. So it's very much an education. Take them where they are. I have a client at the moment who's not sports oriented at all. He's a very much a health, very health imbalanced client. And he eats nothing but processed foods. He goes to the van near his work and gets pine. If he's lucky, he'll have beans with a pie at lunchtime. So you can take that approach and say, well, actually, for the same money, let's see what you can get in terms of fruit and veg and maybe non-organic chicken or non-organic uh, meat sources. So yeah, very much take them where they are. And that's a general advice, whether they have the money or not because it's not always a financial thing. It might be a readiness to change thing, a habituation thing, and ease them in. Some people will jump straight into my detox diet and go thumbs up. Other people, you need to say, mm, I'll do this, but not that. And so you pick and choose. So yeah, really good point. All right. So Thanks for joining, guys, and thanks for listening. I enjoyed presenting, and we had some really nice interactions. I'm going to get the chat feed from uh, Zoom, and I'll announce the winner of the most interactive person tomorrow. So thank you. And we'll also let you know the webinar for next month very shortly as well. Okay. So good night, and talk to you soon.